Alan Turing had a very broad interest in science. He was a pioneer in computer science, in artificial intelligence. But he also made important contributions to, so to say, classical mathematics, number theory in particular. But somehow, his contributions to number theory are much less known, in spite of the fact they are still important up to now. And being invited to give here a talk about Turing, I decided it is appropriate to speak about his number theoretical works. And I am grateful to the organizers of this meeting for giving me this possibility. Most works of Turing in number theory are related uh, Turing's contribution to number theory is well recognized in number theoretical community. In books on number theory, you can find sections titled Turing method, and you can find Turing method in the titles of papers published even in this century. Reading what this author wrote. Reading Turing's paper on this subject which was one of his last one marvels at what he accomplished with the limited computational resources of the day. His method was truly ahead of its time. And actually, this method was introduced in the very last research paper by Turing. The last paper was in number theory. And I will try to explain you what was done and why Turing's method is so important. It is connected with the classical question of number theory with the distribution of prime numbers. By tradition, the number of primes below some limit is denoted pi of x. And so-called prime number theorem, proved independently by Adamar and Valle de Poussin, states that this function grows as x divided by log of x. The exact meaning of this approximate equality is as follows. If we consider the ratio of left-hand side and right-hand side, it will go to one as x goes to infinity. And this can be restated as follows. In the vicinity of x, the probability for a number to be prime is one divided by log of x. And that suggests consideration of the following function, integral logarithm, when I just integrate this density of being a prime number from two to some limit. This function grows in the same way as x divided by log, okay, log of x, and so it can be used for approximating the number of primes below given limit. So we can state the prime number theorem in the other form with this logarithmic integral. And these two statements are, in fact, equivalent. But situation changes. If we, instead of ratios, start to consider differences. Pi x minus x divided by log of x, and pi of x divided by logarithmic integral of x. And here is just a table, and you can see First, that these differences are much greater in absolute value than these differences. And also, all these differences are somehow negative. Why? And a hint to this fact was given by Riemann, who proved this all in formula. Pi of x is equal to logarithmic integral of x minus half of logarithmic integral of square root of x plus such a sum taken over zeros of so-called zeta function, plus some smaller terms. And this formula suggests that, in fact, pi of x should be less than this number, because here we subtract something rather big. Surprisingly, this is not the case. Little proved in 1914 that for infinitely many x, 
pi of x is greater than integral logarithm of x. But it was a purely but little gave no particular example of such an x, not even a bound where to found it. And this was done much later by Skews, who proved that in fact there is such an x satisfying this inequality within such a bound. <laughs> you are laughing today, but at that time this number produced a great impression. And for example, Hardy said, this is the largest number that have solved any definite purpose in mathematics. <laughs> and this number was called skew numbers, skew's number. Uh, later it was <coughs> smaller bounds were obtained, they were also called skew's numbers, and sometimes now they call skew's numbers the least uh, bound for such an X. How Turing was involved in this activity? In 1931, he became a student in Cambridge, and one of the professors there was Ingham, who in 1932 published a classical book on number theory. And in this book, he gave a simplified proof of little theorem. And most important, Skews at that time was also in Cambridge. Moreover, it is known that Turing can skews were rowing on the same boat very often. And it is supposed that during this rowing, skews told Turing about his big number. And the original intention of Turing was just to obtain something smaller. How to do it? Of course, one can look at the formula given by Riemann. I need to explain what is this function briefly. It is defined by such a series. It converges in semi-plane and defines an analytical function which can be extended to the whole plane. During, uh, Riemann proved that all non-real zeros of this zeta function lie inside so-called critical strip. This is a strip where the real part is below zero and one. No, the critical step is outside the region of convergence of the series, which makes it difficult. The famous Riemann hypothesis states that in fact all non-real zeros lie in the middle of this critical strip on so-called critical line. And this is one of the millennium problems, of the seven millennium problems, it is very important for number theory. For example, it implies that this difference behaves like this. It's like square root of x plus some small additional factor log of x. And actually, the Riemann hypothesis is important for computer science also. It was already mentioned the result of Miller. In fact, if the generalized Riemann hypothesis were true, then we would know that there is an algorithm for deciding primality in polynomial time much, much earlier. So what was known at the time when Turing was interested in the Riemann hypothesis? In 1903, Graham proved that the first 15 zeros do lie on the critical line. Later, Beckland proved the same for 78, Hutchinson for 138, and the final number was 1,041, zero, proved by Pitchmarsh. A slightly simpl simplified situation. Actually, Skews proved this bound conditionally on the assumption that the Riemann hypothesis is true. And by itself, using the Riemann hypothesis is not a thing by itself. In today's number theory, we have plenty of results proved under this hypothesis. But Little's proof was unconditional. Actually, it consisted of two proofs. One proof was given under the assumption of the Riemann hypothesis, 
and the other proof on the assumption that the Riemann hypothesis is not true. And much later, Skews published second part. He obtained a similar bound on the conjecture that the Riemann hypothesis is false. And so there were two ways to get a better skew number. Either to find a zero outside the critical line and use the second technique, or to show that many initial zeros do lie on the critical line, it would help to get a better bound. In fact, number theory never was the main occupation of Turing. He did at the same time many things, and in the 30s he published his famous paper about what we now call Turing machine. He went to Princeton to write his dissertation on the Alonso Church, but in, 80, in 1938 he came back to Cambridge and he returned to think about the Riemann hypothesis. And on March 28, he wrote a proposal to Royal Society. It is proposed to make calculations of the Riemann theta function on the critical line for t between 1040, 450 and 6000 with the view of to discovering whether all the zeros of the function in this range of t lie on the critical line. An investigation for t between 0 and 1468 has already been made by Titchmarsh. The most laborious part of such calculation consists in the evaluation of certain trigonometrical sum. In the present calculation, it is intended to evaluate these sums approximately, in most cases, by the use of apparatus somewhat similar to, the, to what is used for tight prediction. He does not call it machine, he calls it apparatus. When this method does not give sufficient accuracy, it will be necessary to revert to the straightforward calculation of the trigonometric, trigonometric sums, but this should be only very ne really necessary. I am hoping that the use of the tight predicting machine will reduce the amount of such calculation necessarily in the ratio of 50 to 1 or better. It will not be feasible to use already existing tight predictors because the frequencies occurring in the tight problem are entirely different from those occurring in the zeta problem. I shall be working in collaboration with MacPhail, a research student who is an engineer. We propose to do most of the machine shop work ourselves, and therefore applying only for the cost of materials. And they estimated their work as 40 pounds. So this is a tight machine. They were in use from 19th century. Do you recognize this formula in this machine? Okay, it's easy. This T is represented by this handle. When you rotate it, T goes up, and this wheel rotates. These omegas are represented by the ratios of these wheels. The angle for which these wheels rotate depends on the number of, uh, depends on the radius of these wheels. And here there are natural devices that compute the cosine function. The output results in these wheels going up and down. And this string is the summator. One point is nailed, and on the other end we have a counterweight. So in this way, we make the sum of 
all these summons. In the range which was of interest for Turing when it had to use the M equal to about 30. And Turing saw an actual tight predicting machine, so the construction was not original. What was original was the idea that such a device used for very practical purposes could be used in purely mathematical research. And here is one particular machine which was used for tight predicting, and here is the counterweight just plots the, the future height of water in the ocean. So it was a very fine mechanics, and it's surprising that two persons wanted to make it all by their own hands, just two of them. Turing got the grant, and the work started, and a number of wheels were produced, but it was the year 1933, and very soon Turing had to switch to another much more important work for cracking the enigma and other machines. So this Turing, so to say, machine for Riemann zeta function has never been constructed. But in the same match of 33, Turing approached the same problem from the other direction. He submitted a paper titled A Method for Calculation of the Zeta Function, where he considered classical mathematical method for calculating this function. What was known before Turing? There was a classical Euler Maclaurin summation, there was Riemann, so called Riemann Ziegel formula found by Ziegel in unpublished manuscripts of Riemann. And then Turing proposed his ideas. These ideas were later superseded. In particular, Adlishke Schoenhage found algorithm which was fast and allowed to calculate many values of zeta function at the same time. And what they wrote about Turing's method. Only one other method besides the euler maclaurin and Riemann-Ziegel ones seem to have been proposed for computing zeta of s to moderate accuracy at large heights, namely the one due to Turing. It was designed to produce higher accuracy than was guaranteed by the crude bounds on the, on the remainder term in the Riemann-Ziegel formula that were able, available at that time and at the same time be more efficient than the euler maclaurin formula. However, very good estimates for the remainder terms in the Riemann-Ziegel formula are now available, which seem to make Turing's method unnecessary. But here, by Turing method, they mean method for calculating zeta function. What I meant by the Turing method is something different, a method for proving that the rows do lie on the critical line. And this method was introduced in another paper published after the war. The paper is organized as a report about particular calculation which was performed here in Manchester. In June 1950, the Manchester University Mark I electronic computer was used to do some calculations concerned with the distribution of the rows of the Riemann zeta function. It was intended, in fact, to determine whether there are any zeros not on the critical line in such particular intervals. It's interesting to note that the calculations were done in an optimistic hope that a zero would be found of the critical line. And the calculations were directed more towards finding such zeros than proven that none existed. It's interesting to look how Turing used the word computer. The computer will probably have his own ideas as how certain steps should be done. 
When Sotisem may be omitted without serious loss of accuracy, he will wish to do so. But actually, here by the computer, he means a human being. And when he wanted to speak about the machine, he used another wooden automatic computer. During crowd, there is no reason in principle why computation should not be carried through with the rigor that with the rigor usual in mathematical analysis. The procedure was such that if it had been accurately followed and if the machine made no errors in the period, then one could be sure that there were no zeros of the critical line in the interval in question. Even with the atomic computer, this rigor can be rather tiresome to achieve, but in connection with such a subject as the analytical theory of numbers, where rigor is in the essence, it seems worthwhile. So the question is, how is it possible that after a final calculation with real numbers approximated with limited accuracy, we can be sure that zeros do lie exactly on the line one half. And such technique was known before Turing. And I will first explain briefly this technique and then explain what was new, was, what new was introduced by Turing. Analytical functions are very wonderful things. They allow many interesting things. And for example, if we consider such rectangular area, and if we want to know how many zeros lie inside this area, we can calculate it by calculating such a contour integral. What is important? This is an integer. So we need not calculate exact value of the integral. It would be sufficient to calculate it with the accuracy, say, with a an, with an possible error, say, one third. Then it would just be sufficient to round this value to the nearest integer, and we would know the exact number of zeros in this rectangular. This is a very general property common to all analytical functions. But in the case of zeta function, we can do something very special. Namely, we can consider zeta fun z function, which is a multiple of zeta function, by some factor, which is exponentiation function. Exponentiation is never zero, so we do, so we do not add any new zeros. This function can be easily computed. And what is, is important? Here, we change the argument. When t range over real numbers, the argument of zeta here range of along the critical line. And this function turned out to be real for real values of t. And so we can plot it. So when t goes here, this argument goes along the critical line, and we see the values of that function z. So now we could try to do the following. Let us select some point here, green points if they are visible. And let us calculate our function z at these points. Again, we do not need to find exact values. It would be sufficient to find the values with some possible errors, as long as we are sure that we can judge what are the signs of our function at these points. If we know that at this point the function is negative and at this point it is positive, then we know for sure that somewhere in between there should be a zero. And in this way, we can count the number of zeros exactly on the critical line. It remains to compare these two numbers. And so the classical method known before Turing was as follows. It consisted of two stages. 
the first stage, calculate this number n of t by calculating this integral. And then try to find such many numbers, green points, go in an increasing order, and check that each time we have a change of sign. If we succeeded, then we would know for sure that all the rows do lie on the critical line. This is a principle, but how could we find these numbers to test the sign of the function? Luckily, Graham, who was the first person to publish proof of about initial zeros with the function, gave a heuristic rule for selecting such points. So here we have this theta function. It grows almost as a linear function because this factor grows very slowly. The theta function comes here in the exponent, in the exponent which can be written as a real part and imaginary part. And this function, the imaginary part, is of interest for us. Naturally, it looks like a sine function. And zeros of this function are now named Gram points. They traditionally are numbered in such a way that the value of the function at point with index m is equal to pi multiplied by m. If we look at the graph of the, as the plot of z and the plot of this sine function, we will see that they behave similar to sine function and cosine function. In other ways, zeros of one functions, function correspond approximately to the extremums of the other function. And so, Gram's points are, should be a good point to check the sign of the z function. Gram expressed, Gram made this observation on looking at initial values of z and theta functions, but later Hutchinson extended it to all possible values of m and called it Gram law. So Gram law can be stated that the values of z function alternate in sign with the growth of m. But ironically, Hutchinson himself found that Gram law is not a law at all. He found the first violations of this law, and nowadays we know that there are infinitely many violations. Look at this picture. Here the value is negative. Here the value is negative. But we cannot judge from the picture what happens here. And in fact, the value in the middle is also negative. So we have three negative values in three consecutive gram points. So we can distinguish between good gram points and bad gram points. And what would we do when we need to find a place where that function is positive? Well, we need just to make some shift from this point. All what we need, the shift should be, should keep the point between the consecutive gram points. In this case, it's rather small value. And so, the classical method was known before Turing was as follows. The first stage, calculate this integral. Then, try to find small numbers, h minus 1 and so on, go on such that these sums go in increasing order, and verify that the change of signs at each point. If we succeed, we know that all the rows on the critical line. And why could we not succeed? In fact, I simplify the situation a bit. When we speak about the number of zeros, we can count them in two ways, with multiplicities and without multiplicities. 
When we calculate the integral, we calculate the number of zeros with multiplicities. But when we count the number of change of signs, we calculate zeros without multiplicities. So a triple zero will be counted only for one zero. And a double zero will never be detected because on both sides of it, the function will have the same sign. And so we are just lucky that all zeros so far were simple. In the first part of his paper, Turing describes this technique. But what new was done by him? He introduced a new method to calculate N of T, very different from what I mentioned before. And then he adds, the paper is divided into two parts. The first part is devoted to the analysis connected with the problem. All the results obtained in this part are likely to be applicable to any further calculations to the same end, whether carried out on the Manchester computer or by other means. And that is really true, and Turing method is used up to now. And now I will try briefly outline what was the new important idea of Turing. So if we believe in Gram law, then the number of zeros should be approximately equal to the number of gram points before, below a given limit. And this number is easy to calculate. Function theta is monotone, so we can rewrite it in this way. By definition of gram points, this is just pi multiplied by m. So this is equivalent to such an equality. So the number of gram points is approximately this ratio. And we can write that the number of points inside the rectangular area is this the main term plus one because we started enumerating of gram points from minus one plus some function which we might expect to be small. And in fact, little proof that it is small on average. And Turing method is based on this theorem of Little. But Little himself did not so how this result can be used for checking the demand hypothesis. Neither did so with Titmer, who made further calculations. And only Turing found the way to use this theorem of Littwald to accelerate checking the Riemann hypothesis. But by itself, Little theorem is useless for computation because it does not tell us anything about any particular value of t because of this capital O notation. The first thing done by Turing was the following. He obtained a quantitative improvement of little theorem. He found exact bounds for the average value of this function s in given interval. And here is part of his paper. Here is a statement of the theorem. And then there follows five pages of a typical number theoretical kind with accurate estimation of different sums and integrals. So what was the idea of Turing? Okay, we want to know if the rows below some t do lie on the critical line. We, for this end, we would need to calculate n of t. But we could select a different value of t, a greater one, and check the same for this greater value of t. And the, this greater value of t might turn out to be more convenient for calculation of this function s of t. And actually, he changed the order of things. He said, let us try to find some t0, which is greater than t. And we will 
say that we want the value of s to be equal to zero. So instead of starting from t and going to the value of s, he predicted the value of s and wanted just to find such t zero. Where to look for such a t? If this is a zero, then this ray, this is integer, so this is an integer. This means that the numerator is a multiple of pi, so the function size should be equal to zero, and this implies that t zero should be our gram point. Okay, so we look for such a t zero among gram points, and now we can do this in the order, in the reverse order. At the gram point, theta is multiple of pi, so this is an integer, and so at any gram point, s should be an integer. That's very good. We want to show it is to be equal to zero. It would be sufficient to show that s is less than one in absolute value. Luckily, in this case, we can do a bit more. We can select a good gram point, and then it is easy to show that in this case, s at this point should be an even number. And so, in order to show that s is in fact zero, it would be sufficient to show that it is an absolute value less than two. How to do it? We start from some good gram point. Next point might be not good, and we need to make some shift. Next points could be bad also, but sooner or later we will find another gr good gram point. And in fact, they are usually the good gram points occurs very often. So usually, this k is rather small number. And here is the main idea of Turing. He was able to bound the value of s from up and from below via the, his version of little theorem plus these additional summons. If we are lucky and they are small, we would have here bound less than two and here greater than minus two, and we are done. So the idea was that originally we had two very different techniques for calculating the number of zeros in the rectangle and on the critical line. And Turing found a easily computational, easy computational way how to use the same shifts h for bounding the number of zeros inside the rectangular area. This was the content of his first part of his paper, and the second part is a report about the actual computation. The second part is nowadays mainly of historical interest, but nevertheless it is of interest. It is interesting to see conditions in which Turing was working. He gives a lot of details about how computation was done, because at that time it was a new thing, and he wrote that a few facts must be mentioned if the strategy of computation is to be understood. He describes the storage. The storage of the machine is of two kinds, known as electronic and magnetic storage. The electronic storage consisted of four pages, each of 32 lines of 40 binary digits. The storage consisted of a certain number of tracks each of two pages of similar capacity. Only of eight of these tracks were available for the zeta function calculations. So you can calculate how many pages you will be able to put on your flash memory in your pocket. He gives a detailed description how this memory was used. One page for logarithmic routine, four pages for table of logarithms, two pages for routine for calculating such terms, one, two pages for input routine, two pages for output routine. And output is interesting. 
In the present case, the output consisted mainly of numbers in the scale of 32. Not decimal, not octal, not hexadecimal, but 32. And Turing found it necessary to give the table of correspondence between digits and symbols print, actually printed. Somehow digits weren't used for themselves. And he writes, the writer, that is Turing himself, was entirely content to see the result in the scale of 32, with which he is sufficiently familiar. <laughs> the reason of 32 was the, because the punch tape was with five rows and so on. It seems that Turing was not satisfied with the result of computations. He wrote, unfortunately, although the details were all worked out on this line, the interval 1,414 less than T less than 1,608 was investigated and checked, but unfortunately, at this point, the machine broke down, and no further work was done. Furthermore, this interval was subsequently found to have been run with the wrong error value. And the most that can be consequently be asserted with certainty is that the zeros lie on the critical line up to t equal to 1,540. Tishmers have investigated so of as far as 1,468. And Turing called it a negligible advance. Well, if we look at the table, really it's not impressive. So here after a decade and more than a decade, we have just 60 more new zeros. And in three years, Lemmer got 25,000. And nowadays we have this very impressive number of 10 to 13. But there are two important things, in fact. On the, was, on the one hand, this calculation started the area of using computers for calculating zeros. If it were not done by Turing, it would be done by somebody else. So it's not the main contribution. What is important is the method introduced by Turing. And this method was used in all consequent calculations. Nobody else was able to invent anything better. So this method is in actual use up to today. I spoke about two papers published by Turing about the Riemann zeta function. Preparing this talk, I read a lot of papers about Turing. And practically, all of them say the, the, the same, that the legacy of Turing in number theory consisted of a number of unpublished manuscripts, a number of letters to other mathematicians. And these manuscripts and letters contain important ideas. But all what was published were just these two papers. But this is not really so. There is a third paper published by Turing, where he deal with the Riemann function, the Riemann zeta function. But somehow, this thought paper remains unknown to number theorists. They don't cite it, and I don't know why. Maybe they don't appreciate the result obtained by Turing in this paper, or maybe they simply don't know the paper, because it's difficult to guess from the title of the paper. The paper was titled System of Logic Based on Ordinals. And actually, it was Turing's dissertation done in Princeton. But section three in his dissertation has a title, Number Theoretical Theorems. And Turing gave a formal definition what he understand by number theoretical theorem. 
by a number of theoretical theorem, which are many theorem of the form. Theta of x vanishes for infinitely many natural numbers x, where theta is a primitive recursive function. Okay, here it's a footnote. I believe that there is no generally accepted meaning for this term, number theoretical theorem. But it should be noticed that we are using it in a rather restricted sense. Then he gives an equivalent definition. An alternative form for number theoretic theorems is for each natural number x, there exists a natural number y such that f of x vanishes, where f of x and y is primitive recursive. So number series may be not satisfied with such definition of what they are doing because of the notion of primitive recursive function used in this definition. But the same class of theorems can be defined in a more arithmetical way. We can consider the well-known arithmetical hierarchy. At the top, we have arithmetical formulas where all quantifiers are bounded. And then recursively, we construct the following levels. We can add universal quantifiers in front of some formula without with bounded quantifiers and get the class, this class. Or we can add existential quantifiers. And then we repeat this process and obtain the hierarchy. And Turing's number theoretical theorems are exactly this class P0 or 2. And having given the definition of number theoretical theorem, Turing, of course, had to give an example. The first example was evident Fermat's last theorem. But as a second example, Turing gives the Riemann hypothesis. At first, it's not even clear that we can find Riemann hypothesis somewhere here because it's about the zeros of a complex function. But anyway, with good technique of arithmetization, we could find a rather complicated formula equivalent to the arithmetical formula equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis. The question was of interest for Turing can be stated as follows. Where in this hierarchy we can does Riemann hypothesis lie? But in a sense, this is a stupid question or a trivial question. Why? The answer is evident. The Riemann hypothesis is just on the very top in this picture. Because it is a very particular statement, it is either true or false. If it is true, then it is equivalent to the statement 0 equal to 0. Or if it is false, it is equal to the statement 0 is equal to 1. And to make it meaningful, we have to state it differently. Given what we know today, where in this hierarchy can we find a formula equivalent to Riemann hypothesis. And Turing gave an answer. He proved that the Riemann hypothesis is a number theoretical statement, theorem, in his, according to his definition. And as I said, this result seems not to produce impression on number theorists. But logicians continued to work in this direction. And 20 years later, Kreisel improved Turing's result. He placed the Riemann hypothesis one level higher. He proved that it can be represented by a formula with universal quantifier in, fight in front of the formula with bounded quantifiers. Again this, again, this did not impress number theorists. The next step would be to place it here, but 
we cannot do it up to now. But nevertheless, there was some progress in this direction. Namely, in 1970, so-called DPRM theorem was proved, and this theorem allows us to specify this phi here. We can take for this phi a formula of the following kind, a polynomial with intensive coefficients being on equal zero. Why this is of interest? Here we have a purely number theoretical statement. The Riemann hypothesis turned out to be equivalent to the statement that one particular definite equation has no solutions at all. And this result was not anticipated by number theorists and was surprising to them. And the question about solvability of definite equations was stated by Hilbert as his tense problem. The Riemann hypothesis was a part of eighth problem. So it turned out that, in fact, the Riemann hypothesis is just a very, very particular case of Hilbert's tense problem. Turing contributed to the proof on the stability of Hilbert's tense problem. Without George Turing, we wouldn't be able even to state what it means. And now we have a formal proof that there is no Turing machine solving the effective equations. But this equivalence shows, gives some, so to say, psychological ex explanation why Hilbert's tense problem is undecidable. In fact, it's incredible that there could exist a universal method for solving defendant equations, all, all defendant equations, because this method would give us, as a byproduct, an answer, positive or negative, to the Riemann hypothesis. So the study started by Turing in this year found result in an unexpected relationship between Hilbert's eighth and tenth problem. Thank you for your attention. So, so, so this would mean that if the Riemann hypothesis fails, there is a weakness in natural numbers, right? Sorry, what? If the Riemann hypothesis fails, yes. then the witness that this polynomial vanishes, this specific polynomial yes. is going to vanish. Do we have any idea how big? Uh, extre this, extremely big, extremely big. Bigger than this, this 10 to the 10 to the 10 to yes, the 10 yes. to the 34? Yes. Down. <laughs> so uh, this reduction seems to be useful for proving or disproving the Riemann hypothesis. Thank you for the nice, uh, very nice talk. Uh, I'm not very familiar with uh, uh, complex analysis. Uh, you talked about the number of zeros in a particular region which can be calculated by this integral. Uh, is it so that there cannot be infinitely many zeros in a local? Uh, no, no, it's known that good functions have only finitely many numbers in the, in the bounded area. And so it, it's impossible for zeta functions to have infinitely many. No, it's... Uh, All right. Thanks. The result you mentioned in 2004 about the large number of zeros that were found, yes. and you said that the main technique is due to Turing. So basically these results were made available because of today's computers, the, the speed that we currently have. Uh, sorry. I'm saying that you mentioned in 2004 the largest number of zeros found. Yes. That the main technique is actually due to Turing. Uh, you, you saw that the verification consists of two steps. To calculate the number of zeros in, inside the rectangular and calculate the number of zeros on the line. Turing method is used for the first step. For the second step for verifying zeros, as I said, there is now a much more powerful technique for calculating. But the, for the rectangular area, it's exactly the Turing method.